that anyone can deny that it doesn't exist anymore. So it's everywhere. So it's touched people. It's me personally, it touched me. Uh, December last year, yeah, December last year, all sitting and dancing. And then on the 24th, I was trying to, uh, on the 24th, I was trying to, uh, I'm sure last year because of the days, I'm not sure I told you. But I was trying to uh, get out the, what did you talk to me? And, uh, and then to defrost it for, for, for the Christmas one. My children always tell me I should do it. So, what I found was I was completely exhausted. So, I was exhausted from the freezer to the kitchen. And then, okay, I'm exhausted, let me go and rest. I probably have a time in there. I had to crawl up the stairs to the upper floor. And I just fell in the bed. And that was my journey. That was how I was for five days, completely five days. I couldn't eat for five days. I had to be encouraged to drink water for five days. And uh, I, I, the only thing that sustained me, two things sustained me, the word of God. I kept saying to myself, I will not die. I will not die and leave. My wife's encouragement. At one point, said I should go to hospital. Like, no way, people are dying in that room. So, you can see, even as long as I have fear in me. So, so I said, I'm not going. I thank God we never had the time to lose all sense of normalcy. So, again, I'm saying that it's real, it's, it's there, it's out there. And to me, it was something more of a, a, a challenge. Because when it all started, uh, on my team in hospital, I told them none of us will die. I, just, I don't know how that pronouncement came, but I just said none of us, nobody will die. Don't be afraid. We know what in this team will die. I will not even have it. And I, it was my point of prayer every day. I never missed a day of work until I, I fell ill on the 24th of December. So I never missed a day of work throughout the pandemic. And I never took holiday because people were not so but I kept working. But the essence of it was, I said, no, but we're not going to lose anyone here. Don't worry, we will not die. And I, felt, I didn't do that just by mercy, but I backed it up by prayer. Each day I called all my staff, their names, and I prayed for them. And I prayed for them. So at the end of it, at the end of it, Caesar's pandemic, they said, oh, there's something here. There's something about this person. He said this, and no, no way. And none of my patients died. None of them died of COVID. We didn't even have COVID. Yeah, well, there was no COVID patient on my wall. That was the only COVID patient. <laughs> but that's it. So that's the history. We have COVID. But again, COVID is not the first pestilence we will have. In the Bible, we have plagues. We know of numerous plagues in the Bible. In Numbers 21, we know of the first plague when they left and they were going into war. What happened? Uh, God, there was a fiery serpent that came and killed people because of their disobedience and the way they spoke against God. So. And God, what did God say? God said, okay, you, Moses, just make a fiery serpent. Make a fiery serpent. Make a fiery serpent. Please, please ever have that. A fiery serpent. And all you need to do is to look at it. And then you do this. Please ever have that. They came from Egypt, they had the worship of the idols, there are some snakes in Egypt, whatever. But no one talked about the fairy sand. No. And that's what saved us. And the fairy sand are only those who look upon it were saved. So if it's there and you don't look upon it, you don't get saved. So, lastly, we got to the vaccine. We have the vaccine. If you don't take it, there are consequences. We know of vaccine hesitancy. 
It's been there before COVID. So it's not a new thing. The World Health Organization in 2014 set up a group, a SAGE group, to look at why, why are people not having vaccines? We are making them all sorts of conditions. But people are not taking them. And they came up with three things. Why? They came up with three broad reasons why people were not taking vaccines. One of them is confidence. The people believe, they trust this vaccine. They trust the people who need it today. And the other one is of masses. What is the value of this? Why do I need to take vaccine? And the third is convenience. Convenience is the availability of how many ways to grow and have it and how to distribute it. That's what we tend to have in more developing countries, not in advanced countries where it's available every day. Complacency is one of the greatest hindrances to vaccine hesitancy. Why? Because it's a, it's a double edged sword. It's a double edged sword in the sense that if every one of us, or if most of us had the vaccine, then we won't see the disease anymore. So people ask, what's the value of having it? Because you don't see it anymore. So at the height of it, when you saw it more rampantly, everybody ran to them because they said, okay, this was, uh, uh, there is a reason for it. So the, the, the success of the vaccine itself becomes its Achilles heel. It becomes a drawback for people having it. So why is it? We don't, we don't see it anymore. We say, oh, there is no beds anymore. Oh, nobody is running for it. Why do I need to take it? So it devalues it because of the success. So what do we know about the vaccine now? We know, we know what? That the vaccine is effective. We know why do we know the vaccine is effective? The vaccine is effective because one, at this point in time, the likelihood of dying if you been vaccinated twice is less if you don't have any underlying condition so it's less than 10 percent so that means one in a hundred could probably die from it if they've been fully vaccinated probably less than that less than that but if one doesn't have it the likelihood of dying the disease today with underlying conditions tips one to nine out of ten. We also know that if you have it, if you have the vaccine and you get infected with the virus, the likelihood of ending up in hospital or in ventilator is low. The vaccine itself does not prevent transmission. So you can still have the virus and be transmissible. But what it does is stops you getting either and it stops you needing more advanced treatment to save your life. That's what the vaccine is for. So it doesn't necessarily reduce the the transmissibility of the virus, what can still transmit. But when they do, they do not die from the virus. They are like, they are less likely to die from the virus because of, of the, uh, the protection of us somewhere. And we also know that the percentage of how effective the vaccine is not is it's been well calculated because now we have in the UK over 91 doses, 91 million doses of vaccines applied in the UK. In the UK's population, there are 60 to 70 million. But there are over 91 doses that have been had, and more than 67 percent have had two, and it's going up all the time because of the drive. And we yet we still see some degree of impact in 
terms of those who are not having it. And I'll put the word the word of uh, the public church uh, in general. He said, we are not all we are not safe until we are all safe. So we are not safe until we are all safe. Until everybody has it, we are not safe. There will always be breakthroughs. There will always be breakthroughs, especially when one person doesn't have it. And that's what we see now in primary schools, uh, uh, in kindergarten or nursery schools. When people refuse to give their children uh, the MMR vaccine, and the child gets infected with the, with the, with the measles and spreads rapidly in that environment, especially from those children who, got, who have underlying conditions, they, they are more susceptible to, to having measles and having fetal alcohol. So again, how bad is this virus? The Delta strain now, I, again, I use the word one of our sisters said about impacting lives as youth, as uh, touching lives. One person, let my life touch another person. The transmissibility of the Delta variant is about 91. So one person can infect and it was and one person touches nine, one out of nine touches another nine, and that's how it is. So that's how that people, the Delta virus, spreads in the community. The Delta strain of COVID 19. So it's very, very transmissible. In fact, it's more transmissible than Ebola virus, more transmissible than even HIV. More transmissible than uh, smallpox that killed a lot of people before the vaccine came. So that's how quickly it spreads in the community. So one way or the other, we know that it's still there. The reason why we, people know it's there is that wherever just uh, to be crude. Uh, Whenever we go to toilet and we flush, or what, what our, our waste material goes to a certain sewage treatment center. And every day or every, every other day, the government goes there and picks a little stuff and check how much the virus is in that stuff. And that's how they know how widespread it is in a certain community. Because they are able to calculate it through the water system. But not the drinking water, but the waste water. So they know it's there. So when they are encouraging vaccine take uptake, they can see it coming. And now down to the youth. It's no, it's not hard science to see why the rates are going up now. We all knew it would come up. We, we, we knew. Once the schools went in full swing, it was bound to come up. But the reason we're not seeing as much death rates and why they are now schools to continue is that most of the adult population have been vaccinated. So but in the youth, the rollout has been low, but now they are encouraging youth to take the vaccine now. So we know it's present in the youth population now. And if you are a fan of popular press, you can see that there are more news about younger people so, succumbing to this disease. So that hence the government is encouraging that younger people have the vaccine. Again, quoting the words of uh, Dr. Chills, Dr. General, we are not safe until everybody is safe. So we need to continue to have it. But why are people not having it? Again, I've told you the vaccine experience, it has so many dimensions. If you bring it down again, there is what is called a personal decision or an individual 
choice. People always talk about being individuals. They are my own person. I'm my own person and I'm perfect in every way. I, I should listen to my own counsel only. I shouldn't do things anybody else asks me to do. Hello. If I look at my own person last year, I can tell you what some of the decisions I made were foolish. But it's hindsight. But for a disease this complex and rapidly evolving, it's dangerous. It's not an individual or one person, it's now a collective decision that we all need to collectively have this thing and do it quickly. And what other things are there? It's peer pressure. As I saw one of the things of our late our sister there, that well enacted drama. About Peer pressure. Peer pressure. Does anyone know the person with the highest following on Instagram? You can guess. It's not me, don't no worry. <laughs> the way to be found in the other for, for certain reasons that we don't know. Oh, well, that's fair. It's for now. Ronaldo has 470 million people following his Instagram account. 470 million. Can you imagine if Ronaldo says, I'm not taking the vaccine? How many people will be let down a dangerous path? So people are getting their news and influences from other places and they are refusing to do what appears right. So my, my challenge to you is who is influencing you? Who is influencing you? Go back question for the thought. Second thing is why I'm here today is about the mental health problems associated with vaccine cancer. We know that people with mental health problems and the lowest uptake of vaccine, even before COVID, even before COVID, the uptake of vaccines, like the typical ones with cold, uh, common cold virus, influenza virus vaccine, less than 25% of people with mental health problems to take. Less than 25. No matter how wide the campaign is. Or how much you said to you try to do yeah. to take it. They, they just they are resistant to taking it. Even though they form one of the largest vulnerable groups that can succumb to common cold, not just not not just uh, COVID. Why are they? Because we know that many people with common with common mental health problems, they smoke more than common. And general population, even four times more than general population with no secrets for smoking is prevalent in people with mental health problems. And again, they are long since already compromised from that. So when they have the virus like influenza or COVID, they succumb easily. They, they just they, they are not able to fight it. But yet the uptake of vaccine is very low. And why is that bad? Because when they don't take the vaccine, they come to the hospital, they infect the workers in the hospital. Or vice versa, workers who do not take the vaccine infect them. So what do we know worldwide? That 90% of mental health facilities suffer from below, suffer from below average use during COVID-19. So people who needed mental health help could not come. Because mental health is, needs more like face-to-face -face interaction with somebody. And it's difficult to deliver if they virtually. Okay? How can you deliver? For example, how do you deliver a mental health message to somebody who is, who is paranoid, who believes people 
you are watching every free television, you only hear the words. So they need face to face contact. And that was lost during the pandemic. So there is a bad law now. So the bad law from assessing a child, for example, ADHD now, is over 18 months. We don't come up with it. And that's similar for, for committing mental health. So you see somebody with the first episode of psychosis. It's over six weeks waiting. It's difficult. So people get terribly unwell and ending up through other pathways to get help. So they either get arrested by the police because of these problems and then they end up in acute mental, uh, mental health illness for treatment. Pathways that were not supposed to be used, they said they were not using. But that's because people were sick, mental health staff were sick, the hospital was being used. You don't want to go back to that era You don't want to face such situation. And one of the commonest things in the population in mental health was fear and stress. And our sleep started this, started with stress. Stress led to all the other things. And what is stress? Says stress has both physical and chemical manifestations. So physical manifestations are that, you know, apprehension, fear, your heart beating uh, too quickly, not being able to make decisions. Then the chemical effect is that you have a lot of stress hormones, hormones to push into your system. Typically, it's cortisol. Cortisol is one of the, is one of the flight or fight hormones. Adrenaline is fight or flight, but cortisol motivates it. And the danger of having excess cortisol is that it reduces the immune system. Over the course of time, the immune system reduces when cortisol is too much in the system. And that makes people more susceptible to all forms of infection and disease. That's stress. And I should not demonstrate that stress led to drug use. We saw an increase, increase, massive increase in the use of alcohol and drugs over the pandemic period. Why? Because the disinhibition was removed. So now all we need to do is to just Go to the store, order a box of alcohol, and get it delivered to your house. So there's the distribution of someone seeing you going to purchase it and asking questions. Do you have a problem? Wasn't there? So people were ordering drugs. So even drug dealers were delivering on post code by, by apps, by text. The patient found someone who had to deliver to one of the units, bought her. Um, a pizza, I won't mention the name of the company. And then uh, the check for just one brown pizza. And the charge was uh, uh, 70 pounds. So for vigilance of someone who said, how can this doesn't match up? And when they lifted up the pizza, there was drugs. So it was regular where you see the drugs. You also saw some degree, especially for the older people, the suicide rate jumped in place. Because one, his spouse had died, there was hopelessness, and they felt that there was nothing they could do. They didn't want to get away, so they took their own lives. So those have brought big, big impact of COVID over every one of us. Every life was impacted, from the youngest to the oldest. Children lost their parents. Things that can never be corrected ever again. But now we have a solution. No, no, we've got a perfect solution. There's no perfect solution. But we've got something, we've got an edge here. We've got vaccines available. They have efficacy. We can reduce the length of stay you have in the hospital. It can also prevent one from having severe illness that can kill them. We need to encourage people to take it. We need to encourage everyone to have this vaccine. And that's all we have to do. But also ourselves, we have to demonstrate that we can do 
we should be taking. I'll write my two vaccines I'm waiting for my booster. And I'll also have COVID. So I know to some degree how good it is. So I've been in an environment where people have been sick. I know about the COVID, but I, I wasn't infected. I didn't suffer sickness like I had last year. So I encourage you all. Please let's spread the news and let's have it done quickly. And when the time for the roll-up is your turn, please do not hesitate to have it. Thank you very much. first one, second one, and even this third one. So please and please let us pay our vaccines. But I know that, you know, from the talk that you heard, you might have some questions for the doctor. So I'm going to, to throw the uh, floor open for you to uh, ask any questions. Uh, can we get the other microphone ready? Yeah, so can I see any, anyone with a question with their hands raised? I see that hand, I see that hand, I see that hand, I see that hand. Any other hands? Do you want us to take all the questions first or you want to take them one by one? As you please. Okay. Um, all right, Let, let's start from uh, Dr. Tom. Uh, can you give him the microphone? I'll, I'll read the floor for you. Praise the Lord. I thank you for the talk. Uh, I have a friend in the US who got COVID and I got to work on the show without doing anything. So I said, like, once you have COVID and you, you get your, your body system develops and you need to take this thing, like, you cannot contract it again. So now it's saying you don't want to take the vaccine. So like, is it true, like when you have COVID and you get well without the vaccine, like you somehow you don't develop develop some immunity against COVID and you can never get it again? That's not true. Thank you, sir. That first, that's not true. That's not true because uh, because the way it is, the way immunity is generated is true very complex system of cells. It's called the, the B cells. And B cells are not, they are not everlasting cells, they die. For example, our blood cells, common blood cells, it's 72 days after it goes away. So it keeps needs repeating. So that's why the bone marrow needs to function. So the, the cells that produce this immunity do it and it will die. The antibodies to counteract the virus is produced by the cells. So if you have it once, you don't have it for you don't have an immunity forever. You don't have an immunity forever. And again, it's only true for one part of one disease known to man so far that you have that cell, like smallpox. But again, smallpox is different from this one. Smallpox does not show mutation. This one changes. We have the A, we have the, we have the alpha, we have the beta, and then we have the delta variant. The delta variant is the one that is on now. So this one is changing itself. So I think your friend might have been infected by the alpha variant. If it gets the delta, it doesn't have the same immunity. So one vaccine will confer to you 72%. That's why they want you to take two to increase it to 90% coverage. 
So we need goals. And that's why we are talking now about the third goals now towards this period because it's going down the 80 days now. So please advise your friend to do it. To do his best in case. Thank you. Uh, I just want to know um, about the guy. I was very close to um, I have a friend um, who decided she was very scared of the kids that were taking the vaccine. I got my two vaccines and I don't understand this part. So um, she's skeptical because um, she wants to get pregnant and um, uh, she's a very little person. In fact, she's in the medical life. And I told her, Although there's no um, research about this, why not try? She said, you know, I can't give you permissions and up to now she's not even had her first place. So my question is, what's the place of um, this vaccine when it comes to pregnancy and then um, fertility? Because I remember when I went to have my first dose, they asked me, am I pregnant? So I, I just want to know what's the place of the vaccine when it comes to pregnancy and fertility. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think those, that question, a very, very good question, very, very good question. And I don't think your friend is the only one that has made that decision. Uh, it's very hard to explain um, because no one is allowed to do research with pregnant women. Don't do research with children. Don't be pregnant women. That is completely unethical. So when vaccines are tested, they are not tested in that group at all. Nobody does that because of the child they are carrying, the child has no capacity. So while all these things are going, there's a lot of legal rampant. So that's not tested. Even paracetamol is not tested in women, in pregnant women, or yet to see pregnant women. Because that's the, that's the nature of medical research. It's not wrong. But now, the people, one of the highest risks, one of the high risks in COVID at this time are unvaccinated pregnant women. So, unvaccinated pregnant women who have COVID and do not survive. So, it's a very high risk. And uh, I'm sure that the, the, the persons making that choice is doing for the right, what they perceive to be the right reason. But I think they are playing the game of chance. I don't like chance. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, so that's where I'll be very cautious to make it that decision. Fertility again was widespread on Instagram. By a certain Instagram star who mentioned something to their followers that had affected male fertility and female fertility and said it was that it was caused by COVID. That's not true. That's absolutely not true. Yeah, the, the fertility has complex factors. So we know that, for example, the ratio of children to adults in the UK and Western population is falling, including people who were born in Africa and lived here is falling. How that is happening, we don't know. Nobody knows. It's not just about sort of growing space, expensive or not, but people here are not as far as we are in our world. But it's a complex thing. So, back to your question, it doesn't affect fatigue. Right. Um, my question is this. I, I took the first one of the first one the UK to your house. Um, um, at the same time, I was given a car, I was already a car, and then there's a leaflet that I read. And within that leaflet, there is so you can take the second dose after three weeks or so. So, but um, my second dose, the point that I have my second dose is eight weeks. So, my question now is 
why um, disparity? Why disparity? Why disparity? Yeah. yeah. They told me I should. I can come from seven rows after three weeks. That's what's put in the pamphlet and the leaflets uh, came to me. So, but they are quite happy to me to take seven rows without having to fix. So, the question is why do we have this eight weeks gap? Meanwhile, the leaflets said we can have it after three weeks. Okay, I think I, I, I can get that. Uh, I think I'll first go to what. Try not to hide under so many jargons. Um, the way it was designed, okay, the, I don't know which one you have, whether it's Moderna, whether it's AstraZeneca or Pfizer. It's Pfizer. Okay, it's Pfizer. Okay. So Pfizer, Biotech, Biotech. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's an mRNA, mRNA whatever virus. But what was, when, when they did clinical research, the first step is to an animal, to see an animal, whether it's a or not. Then you go to the, to the, the first phase of the production to get very 100 percent fit people, so that's young people. And then you give them the dose of the vaccine. You look at the side effects and see what's happening. Then the second, the, the second uh, level of clinical trial is to test what the dose is, what actually is the effective dose. So in that trial, we get about 400 people, we give them the dose, check the antibody, and see how it falls, and see, try to establish what dose range you need to give them to make them effective. Before you go to the third stage, where you compare who have and who do not have. So in the second stage of clinical trials, we decided that the Pfizer scales. Remember then when Pfizer and all these vaccines were developed, they were for the alpha variant, not this deadly delta variant. Okay. So when it was designed, then it was said that you have the first one, and then if you have the second one, within 28 days, you have 90, you have 96 percent coverage. But as was when it started being rolled out. So when it's not being rolled out, it was found out no actually, you still get up to 80% after three months. So this new guideline of eight weeks is a new one. But before it was first dose and then the next will be three months later. So probably it's more of a new rollout scheme to make it eight weeks. So that's all about the effectiveness. So two doses you cover give you almost 90, 73% effectiveness. So it's, it's still remains. So the antibodies get formed and they remain. And after that, they start to go down. They start to decrease rather than until they are out of the system. There's this general conspiracy about the there's a general conspiracy about the whole vaccine thing, like uh, a lot of these um, social media which causes this fear and major reasons or one of the reasons why a lot of people don't really want to take the um, vaccine. One of them which has to do with a conspiracy though, which has to do with uh, people being affected negatively after vaccine for the air twice and uh, um, there's probably an after effect later in the future if you receive the uh, after the end of vaccine, maybe I don't know, maybe reducing the immune system or the lungs or something like that. Like, you know, so I don't know if you can make clarification on that or if we can get a better exposure or those um, conspiracies. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Um, I, I must say that. Uh, this is the uh, discussion I often have with my wife. We, we, we live in different times, like the whole. This is your time is not too. Your time is fascinating. It's, it's fascinating. And every time I'm in touch with the technology people have now, I, I just say, wow, this is how we grew up in, in five years. Driving a car that 
be the key that will kill us. Now, voice control. All of so, you guys are on an immense information overload. So, it's how to shift what is it. We didn't have those words in our time. My brother just says, Go and get this and I get it. I didn't have a second friend, a third friend. 3,000 people on Instagram to convince me whether what my father was saying was true or not. I just believed it. So, so I totally accept your anxieties now. I, I really, I think it takes great courage and a good sense of belonging to be in these times and remain safe. But what I can give you is the scripture. It's Proverbs 43. Guard your heart because out of it comes life. You have to guard your life. You have to put in the filters in your heart. What you can get. Conspiracy stories will be there forever and ever. And they are so much, most of them are not true. And the second thing they are contending with is they are. It's the algorithm. So the moment you plug in something in your Yahoo and it has your name in it. Any computer you pick up says the same thing. And that's, that's driving the information overload. It's driving the wrong information. So it negatively points to, to, for example, if you die, if you are screened on Google and just put RCCG, it's never going to say anything about the miracles that have been done. People who have been saved. Going to go back to the negative stories about ISIS. And that's how the AI is set up. That's how the conspiracy theories are. They are set up in that way to generate this falsehood and it grows, it grows and grows and grows and grows. The second thing I will tell you is that look at what he said in Ephesians 4 8. He says clearly, he said, only think of things that are pure, things that are excellent. No, all other things that are not good, don't think about them. Things that are common good. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not succumbing to cold. I don't succumb to cold that easy. But I think I've taken cold the flu vaccine consistently for years. Why? Well, not for myself, because I don't think I fall into the group for But I look, I do it for the people I look after. And if I have, if, if, if it's on me, but it's not harming me. I don't want it to harm in person. So please, please filter out the information you get and filter it really good. There are very few words you can read the New England Journal of Medicine and all those things that are peer reviewed, reviewed by people who have it. It's not like my patient says sometimes, I say, take this medication. They say, oh, the drug company is paying for you. They are paying me, and I said, I don't try the Ferrari, I wish I could. But they are not paying me, I'm doing the service that I know what to prevent. So please, let's, let's disinform the conspiracy theories. Let's completely move away from them. Let's move away from them. And it was so sad, it was sad because if you watch the people who in the UK, who succumbed last night, recently uh, to COVID, who wouldn't have the vaccine. All of them were making last minute videos from their deathbed saying, I wish I had taken the vaccine. And the doctor said, It's too late to have it now. It's not going to change the world. Oh, I didn't believe in it before. But there are several YouTube videos about your AI will never be taking those videos. It will take you to the video, but it's take you to the video of somebody who said they were a nurse and then they were really that they tell people not to take you. The AI will take you there. But if you give you search, there are people who made last videos saying how I wish I had taken this person. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you very much, sir. My question is, um, during Ebola 2015, Ebola outbreak, uh, Big Gate proposed that how prepared are we? Do you agree with that, that NHS 
government, Christian, Muslim, are they prepared for more pandemic? Ah, that's a global question. Thank you, a very important question. We can never, we can never be 100% prepared for anything. This one covers what I mean. I call the world on our ways because it jump from the animals to jump from the animal to human being. Because always in the animals, playing with them, they didn't die for me. But until the jump, it crossed that barrier. And like you said, there are all millions of viruses. And there are all people who are sampling blood of every animal, trying to find out which is the next one, which one is going to behave this way next time. And they are all, they are tracking, they are global tracks for all these things. But yet, once in a while, we just have this job that is completely, it's complete. I mean, if you do not believe God, you just need to find out how this virus is to make you believe that there is a God. Because it's almost as if it's an intelligent thing in his own. You know, you devise this one for it, it finds another solution, it does this, it does that. It defies all forms of knowledge you've ever had. So that's the nature of it. So we, are never, we can never be 100% prepared. But what we can do is to listen to the best advice and then to follow it. To listen to the best advice and follow that advice. That's the first thing we can do. Thank you. Thanks. Can I just ask one last question is uh, linked to what I mean today because uh, we, we are actually focusing on um, Black, and Black Asia and affected minority people. And um, we know that vaccine hesitancy is, uh, is predominant in this uh, community. So why would you what would, you, what would you say uh, is the reason for this? Why is it so common for this discussion? Thank you, Pastor Ade. The vaccine hesitancy is so complex. Uh, there, are, there are so many studies on vaccine hesitancy, even among uh, the BME group, uh, uh, and, and the reasons vary. And I think also one of the uh, one of the uh, one of the issues with us is I, think, I don't think it's more in terms of the younger population in the group, but it's more in my own generation and people above me. And we tend to believe what people say rather than find out the facts for ourselves rather than weigh the evidence for us. So we're, we're close to leaders, so whether it be imams, whether it be uh, pastors, whether it be leaders of, of faith organization, we tend to get our time and information from such, from such places. For example, uh, Polio, polio was almost eradicated from Nigeria. Almost eradicated from Nigeria. Except for the northeast in Nigeria. And there was a powerful imam there who said that women who have made young girls or people who have polio would, be, would not be fatal. Or they said polio came from pork or something like that. And then people stopped having polio vaccine. And what children were born, they had polio, they were crippled for life. But polio was almost eradicated up to that point until the government had to step in and change that. So it was the where father believed the information he is coming from and was totally reliant on that. I think that's what we need to do is to have that sense of critical thinking, weigh what people say to us. Weigh what people say to us. In fact, it's, it's in, I think it's in John 18, when Pontius Pilate 
had this wonderful discussion with Jesus. And he was uh, he said, you are, the, yeah, he said, you are the son of God, whatever. And then he, he thought it was, Pontius Pilate asked, what is the truth? What is the truth? What am I here to believe? Is it what they are saying or what you are referring? You will not even tell me more. And he said, for this reason I was born. That's the only reason I came to be that. But he said, what is the truth? And you have to ask yourself, what is the truth? Truth is not simply, it's not very simple. It's a complex way how it comes about. And it has to be tested. And finally they knew that he was the son of God. The moment they put him up there and things happened. And it's still happening today. We know that Christ is the son of God. Because whether we like it or not, there are people who still call upon that name and are saved. Even at the, whatever junction they are in, they are, whatever difficulty they face. So back to uh, uh, my pastor's question, it's about a generational issue sometimes. It's about knowledge in that generation. And again, it's about complacency. So I've seen people who say, oh, my grandmother smoked 100 cigarettes a day and nothing happened to her. Mm-hmm. I can also tell you that my own grandmother, my grandmother who smoked 10 and had cancer. So it's about the, where the information is coming from and the complacency. Because in that generation, we always believe that we are tough, nothing happened. I give you one thing to take home today. If I ask you, what do you think has made our, our life expectancy as globally, globally life expectancy grow from 45 years to about probably in Japan, 82 to 85 years, what do you think it is? It's simply addressing infectious diseases. The, the things that have been done to tackle infectious diseases is what has brought down, has increased our last expectancy globally. Now, if you see if you go to from where I, from where I came from, ah, somebody was seventy. Ah, celebration of life. What then? Uh, somebody was seventy-two died in the hospital. Such a young person. Really? <laughs> so the shock and horror. Uh, really? So it's the elimination of those childhood diseases. That's why there is a lot of programs by the world. If you look at all the vaccines that are given now, most of them give you zero to five years of life. The lungs, the memory, the tetanus, all those things are given around that age. Until 18 for the uh, 16 for HPV. But everyone else is quite early. And that's what has brought us here to the point of 82. A pastor's and uh, uh, co pastor of a church that used to serve in, in Kent, uh, King of Glory Christian Assembly. And um, not only that, we go a long way back, it was one year by senior school, and uh, it was also uh, my adversary when we played football. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. So, thank you very much. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Uh, uh, to see you for the day. And um, uh, we are closing now. Uh, I just want to recognize um, uh, the place we can be right now is the Youth Church. God bless you. Thank you for coming. Uh, don't be in a hurry to leave. Uh, uh, a little sleep will be passing in your head just so you can feel your details and get to know you better. Uh, the truth of the matter is